Yeah, we are live. All right, and we are live, and we're in person, and we are probably going to finish 1 Corinthians this morning. Starting uh, 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to pick up about verse 34 and see what God's Word does to chastise us or to uplift us today. You ever noticed in and whenever you're going through life from the time that you're a little bitty child all the way through life, you're either being chastised or rewarded. I mean, there's a rare little time that you're just kind of sitting there, just kind of running under the radar and nothing going on. You're either, you're either getting a pat on the back or being good or getting your behind kicked because you've done something wrong. Why can't we learn to just do right? Well, if you just do right, you're going to get rewarded. You know, If you just do the right thing for the right reason, God will honor that. I think that's a hard lesson for us, you know. Just do the right thing for the right reason. But in, uh, if we pick up in um, 1 Corinthians 15, starting at 34, it says, Awake to, to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Now, he's talking to people in the church. Some people in the church have not the knowledge of God. Why is that? What are they doing in the church? Are they playing church? Are they sitting there hoping for something better? Is it the thing to do of the day? If you're claiming to be a child of God, you need to know about God. We need to study his word. We need to pray and seek him. Okay? Amen. And seek the righteousness. And verse 35 says, But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And what body do they and with what body do they come? Now, he's saying folks are going to question you whenever you speak of the things of God, whenever you speak of righteousness, whenever you speak of God's glory, when you speak of the resurrection that he spent all of the rest of the chapter fussing about them not knowing. And he's going to explain that because folks are going to ask questions, so we need to know. Remember it says, study to show thyself, approve, rightly dividing the word of truth. It says that in Timothy. The reason for that is because even people in the church are going to have questions. And as a child of God, as a, we're supposed to be learning of God, seeking God so that we can pass on the knowledge of God, so that we can continue the love of God and continue in his ways so that it's not lost every generation. Remember the Israelites? Get close to God, get things going. Then they'd forget to teach their children. They'd forget to carry on. They'd get complacent. They'd get what fat and happy. And then they would have troubles because no one knew about God and knew how to be godly. Verse 36 says, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. It's talking about the body. Why has this body got to die to get a spiritual body? Why has this body got to be different? When you think about that, a seed has to die. Okay, it basically rots and then comes out the sprout of it. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat and some of other grain, but God giveth it a body and has, and it, as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. What's he talking about there? He's given an example of how the seeds rot and everything grows by God's grace, okay? Every plant that grows is growing by God's grace. They can't scientifically prove what causes life. They cannot produce life in a laboratory, okay? They can find life, okay? They can manipulate life, but only God gives life, okay? And only God gives the, gives the body of life. All flesh is not the same flesh. He's making a lot of good points here. But there is one kind of flesh of men. Okay, One kind of flesh of men. Okay, All human. Okay, And another of beasts and another of fishes and another of birds. There's also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial one and the glory of the terrestrial one is another. This is the one glory of the sun, and another the glory of the moon, and another the glory of the stars. For one star differs from another, differs from another star in glory. 
Now, what is he talking about? It's all different, okay? We're all going to be different. God's going to give us a glorified body whenever we're with him. Whenever we're absent from this body in death, we're going to be present with the Lord in our glorified body. And he's going to get deeper into that. And I don't want to get ahead of myself too much. But as we're looking at that, we all have the fleshly body, the sinful body of Adam, okay, in our physical, okay? And as Christians, whenever we die or whenever we're taken out of here, okay, at the sound of the trump, we're going to have what they call either the, uh, the resurrected or the glorified body like Christ, okay? So the difference is we're going to, we're all resemble Adam now. We will all resemble Christ then with the glorified body at the resurrection. And that's what he spent so much time fussing about the resurrection for because there is a resurrection. Otherwise, we're wasting our time. We're all just dead in our sins. And we know that, that's, that we are not. Verse 42 says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. Okay? This corrupt, vile body, this vessel of sinfulness is going to die and rot and will be raised up with a glorified body in incorruptible, okay? That's when we're going to be perfect, sinless, and in the presence of God Almighty, okay? It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. See, we don't honor the flesh. That's why he tells us all the time that there's a battle between flesh and spirit all the time, okay? It is sown in weakness and raised in power. Now, all of that, if we're thinking about it, gives us pretty good... It, it, it's kind of... Well, my, my word just kind of skipping on me. Give me just a second. It should be great comfort to us to know that this isn't it, okay? The pain that we may now suffer, the mental lapses we may now suffer, the problems that we may now suffer... When we're with him, those are all be gone, okay? It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So, you know, this ain't it. This ain't going to heaven, okay? It'll all be changed, okay? People are worried about, well, what about those bodies that was lost, those that were marred? How about those that evaporated whenever, you know, whatever explosion happened? Have, and I have to say, have you ever met God? Have you ever read his word? He created all that in the beginning. And that's not what it's going back to. Okay? He made it all stitched together. He's not going to be confused or confounded at the resurrection. It will be easy and simple for the glorified bodies. Okay? Okay? And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was a living soul, and the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. They're comparing <laughs> Jesus and Adam together on that, okay? From the first, how be it, that was not first, that was not first which is spirit, spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual, like I was saying a minute ago. Adam, through Adam, sin entered the world, Okay. And the flesh all resembles Adam, okay? Through Christ, salvation entered, okay? And all spiritual things. So all spiritual bodies will resemble Christ, okay? Because they all, all salvation descends from Christ, okay? No matter who led you to Christ, it's all in Christ. And it all resembles Christ. Otherwise, it's a fake salvation and it's not true or real, so... The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is of the Lord from heaven, okay? So don't let that scramble your mind. As, as is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And that, as it is, is the heavenly, such is they that are heavenly. Now, as Christians, we should be striving Striving. I'm not saying we're going to make it every time because we're going to fail. Striving for sinless perfection. Okay? Doing what we can to do right. 
every time, okay, for the right reason. Not looking for great gain, not looking for what's in the Wiffum theory, what's in it for me, okay? What's in it for you if you honor and glorify God, if you put your faith, trust, and hope in Christ? I can tell you what's in it for you. Eternal salvation instead of eternal damnation, okay? I was talking to somebody the other day, and they said, oh, you only live once. I said, yeah, but you can die forever. Think on that. You're thinking about this body and you only live in one, you only go around once? That's right, so you better get it right. You better put your faith in Jesus. Because if you're grabbing all your gusto and you think you and your friends are going to have a party in hell, that is incorrect. Hell is a separation of God from God. It's a separation from everyone. It is total loneliness, total darkness, and total torment. No light. All light comes from God. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, see, we now bear the image of the earthly. It's on us. We shall also bear the image of the heavenly. We will look like Jesus. Not exactly, but we will resemble Jesus because we put our faith in him and we will be descended from him spiritually. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So don't think you're taking this body with you. Okay. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. It's all got to go. It's all got to go. I'm not saying go out and hurt yourself. God will take care of all of it for you. Okay? He'll do all the changing. He'll have all the timing. There's nothing we can do but live for him. Okay? The best we can do is not good enough for our salvation, just in case you wonder. If you're working your way, I'm going to do better. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I'm going to learn more of the Bible. Okay. We'll start off learning about the truth of salvation. It is a gift of God by faith through grace. By grace through faith, yeah. And see, even my mind twist on me. It's by grace through faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Which one of us does God owe salvation? Which one of us does God owe anything? Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not sleep, but we shall all be changed. Now, I was told that that was the, uh, should be put over every nursery in every church. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. But it's not, it's not really funny. It's, a, it's the truth. We'll all be changed. We will not all die. Some of us will be changed alive whenever Christ comes back into our spiritual bodies. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. Now, how quick is the twinkling of an eye? I've been told it's a blink, but it's not really a blink. It is the little light flash. Whenever, you, whenever somebody turns and the light flashes off of their eye, and you see that flash from light, that twinkling of eye, that's light speed, okay? Light speed will be changed from flesh to the spiritual body. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. So Paul thought he was going to be alive then because he said, and we shall be changed. He thought he was going to live to see the resurrection of the dead. We should feel like we're going to live to see the resurrection of the dead. We should know, think that it is so close that we need to be telling people about Christ, that this flesh doesn't matter that much, that we don't need to be worried living in the flesh and sacrificing for the flesh because it could happen any minute. We need to be so convinced that Christ is coming again. That trumpet will sound and we'll all rise. The dead in Christ will rise first and then we'll be changed in the twinkling of an eye. How many folks really got their mind around that and really concerned about it? For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. You know, you can't live in heaven with this body. 
I don't know why, but God made it that way. This corruptibleness cannot be in the presence of God. Sin cannot be in the presence of God. That's why if you had the old, old Testament saints were in a holding place called Abraham's bosoms until Jesus paid the price for sin, till it was all cleansed, okay? That place is empty now because Christ has come, okay? That's whenever he went and preached to the captivity in Peter that's talked about. They can be now in the presence of God, but until the sin debt was paid, no one could enter the presence of God. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. How about that? Death is swallowed up in victory. That's good to know, isn't it? O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? And he explains right here. The sting of death is sin. So our sins being paid for by Jesus Christ takes away the sting. Death is not a sentence to hell because we put our faith, trust, and hope in Christ. And the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in, in vain in the Lord. And he took a lot of time in the first part of this chapter talking about how if there's no resurrection, if there's no, if there's no truth afterlife, if there's no being in the presence of the Lord, you're wasting your time teaching. But 58 goes over that, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. That's why he was telling us to study and to learn about God before, because if you only know little bits of verses, if you only know little bits of stuff, people can come up with half verses and half truths and they can drag you off out in the woods with them because it, it sounds right whenever they say it so fast and they look like they knew what they were talking about. And they can have even the elect, even saved folks, they can be twisting their minds and dragging them off out there, making them worry about things, vain things. And know that anything that we do to help people know about Jesus Christ is not a waste. Chapter 16, verse 1 says, Now concerning the collection of the saints, uh oh, that's the offering, ain't it? As I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered him, and there be no gatherings when I come. The first day of the week. All of these Gentile churches were meeting on the first day of the week. They never met on the Sabbath. They never worshiped on the Sabbath. They're not Jews, okay? There's some of these folks that are out there twisting things up and saying, if you're worshiping on Sunday, you've already taken the mark of the beast. You've taken the Catholic church's propaganda, you, and they, they just make all sorts of stuff up, okay? There's nothing wrong as a Christian worshiping on Sunday morning. Sunday is not the Sabbath, okay? We're not commanded as Christians. Our Sabbath is Jesus Christ, our rest. We rest on Jesus, okay? On the first day of the week, it's a day of worship. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, them will I send to bring your liberty to Jerusalem. Now, And you notice on there, he says, as God hath laid him in store, as God hath prospered him. If God's prospered us, we're supposed to be blessing others. We're supposed to be giving to help keep churches open. We're supposed to be giving to help other people, to uplift people. And as God has prospered and as God has given you the notion, that's what we give. I don't spend a lot of time worrying about offerings and tithes and that sort of thing because God will deal with you on that, okay? God has made it clear throughout before 
the law that folks were to take a tenth to give, to honor him. Those that don't, he'll deal with. Okay? And I leave that there because it's a personal it's a personal thing between you and God, just like your salvation is. And when I come, whomsoever, uh, okay, in verse 4 says, And if it be me that I go also, they shall go with me. Paul didn't know at that time if he was going back to Jerusalem or not, how that was going to go. Now I will come, un come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, whither with you, that ye may bring me on my journey whithersoever I go. And Paul did. He wanted to go and spend time at each of these churches preaching and teaching and getting to know the people and uplifting them and, and trying to trying to disciple them in the truths of God. A lot of time, I think we get preachers, pastors, bishops, whatever they want to call themselves, that are so full of themselves that they don't want to take the time to come to each church to preach and teach and to love and uplift. There's some of them I think have gotten their positions that don't know how to preach and teach and uplift. I mean, we've got a lot that do, but there's some, they've got a position and they don't really know and study the things of God. They study how monetarily to run the church, how to be administrators rather than to be evangelical, to be disciplers of the people. What's more important, how financially sound the church is or how spiritually sound the church is? And that's something other that, you know, will hit some of them. They'll, they'll go into convulsions if you say something like that. Well, you got a great, nice building. How many people are saved? How many people know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior? Or how many are getting a happy song and a, and a wave and, and a shake and telling them they're okay? For I will not see you by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you if the Lord permit. And see, that's something that Paul said a few times. If the Lord permit. We get our mind around that. because We get an idea of what we're going to do and how we're going to grow the church and how we're going to have this great service or why we're going to do that. And we forget if the Lord permit. You know, God might not be ready. He may not have made the way yet. We need to pray a lot of times more than we do before we step into something or other. I know I'm guilty of that. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door of effect of effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. You know what? If you're really doing God's work, there's going to be many adversaries. You might not see them. You might feel the little stabbing pains as they stab you in the back and run around and do different things. But there's always many adversaries. Now, if Timothy has come, see that he may be with you without fear. Now, this is an instruction. Here comes, there's a young pastor coming, there's a young evangelist coming. See that you see that you treat him right. And I've seen this before. A lot of these different churches, somebody comes in and uh, he's going to be picked apart. He had misstates one thing. He stutters when he reads the Bible, anything else. They're going to eat him alive. And he's saying, let him come without fear. Let him understand that y'all love him and that y'all know that he's teaching you straight. For he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. Now, he's a good preacher. He's human. Don't be ugly to him. Let no man therefore despise him. You ever had anybody hating a preacher that come in? Yeah, there's there's some that traveling preachers is, folks, I hate them in a hurry. He don't, I don't like the way he preaches, you know? I don't like the way, I don't like the way his voice sounds. I don't like the way he talks. But conduct him forth in peace that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come at this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. So whatever reason, Apollos didn't want anything to do with the Corinthians at this time. He's like, nope, I ain't ready and they ain't ready. But sometimes it may be 
that he's following the Spirit of the Lord. It's not time for me to go there yet. It's not time for me to preach there yet. It's not time for me to study there yet. Watch ye stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men. Be strong. Are we doing that? Are we watching? Are we watching for Jesus? Are we watching for other things? Watching for an opportunity to do right? Do we stand fast in the faith or does somebody come up with half a verse and make us shake us up a little bit? Do we quit? Do we quit acting like men and start acting like godly men? Are we just going to be strong man? Are we going to be a godly man? Be strong. Be strong in the Lord. That means taking a stand sometimes. It doesn't mean going out and, and picking a fight. But sometimes, as godly people, we just have to say, no, that's not right. Just not going to do it. It's not going to be around it. Let all your things be done with charity. So anything that we've done with love in our heart, love in action, okay? Do it for the right reason because we truly want to see people saved. We truly want to see people do well. We truly want to see them moving in the right direction. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Archaea and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Now, that whenever I'm reading and studying that, this house, this family have addicted themselves to the ministry of saints means they do they, it, it's like an addiction to them. They're going to try to help anybody that they can. Okay, They're going to uplift. They're going to give monetarily. They're going to give food. They're going to pray with. They're going to sing with. They're going to carry them to the doctor. They're going to do everything they can for those within their church. They're knocking themselves out to be good to people. They're addicted. They can't help but do good. What would happen to our churches if we got like that where we couldn't help but do good? Would folks want more of it? Or are there enough users out there that would knock us off and make us where we don't want to do it anymore, that our addiction would be broken? Things to think about, isn't it? If we just really tried to do good, we're addicted to it. You can't stop us from it. We're going to do it. That you submit yourselves unto such and to everyone that helpeth us and laboreth. I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and of Fortunus and of Archaeus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. So we've got some new people coming in. Believe it or not, sometimes we have to have new people come in because the church is lacking something, and God will send them in. And whoever was trying to do that job that wasn't qualified is going to be mad. You know, you ever seen that? It's kind of like, well, I've been doing that for 30 years. Well, you ain't done it right yet. Get out the way of hush. God sent somebody in that knows what they're doing. Just because we can do something don't mean we should. Amen. God has something better in mind sometimes. And we hold so fast to that thing that we think that we're doing for God. Whenever the right one comes along, we're not going to turn it loose and it's not going to be done right. It's kind of like a stranglehold on the church, and I've seen it a few times. Folks in power with a stranglehold on it, and they're not going to let go and let God. God's not in control. The deacon board's in control, or the pastor's in control, or the uh, board of trustees is in control, and they're not going to let God run the church. They're not going to let godly people run the church because they could run it into the ground. Okay. When God supplies the right people, vet them, check them, make sure they love the Lord. Make sure they can give you, as members, the uh, have them tell you. If they can't give you a full witness of how and when they got saved, if they haven't got a testimony. Why haven't they got a testimony? If they haven't got a testimony, I'd say they probably hadn't been saved. So vet these people. And including 
pastors, including especially pastors and Sunday school teachers, have them give you a clear presentation of how they got saved. What is it that makes you sure you're going to heaven? If they can't tell you how they're getting to heaven, they sure can't tell you how to get to heaven. Okay? For they have refreshed my spirit and yours, therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. Put people in place that need to be in place. Use the people that God gives you for good. The churches of Asia salute you. Aquila and Priscilla salute you. Much in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the way down to the bottom, 23, it says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. My love be with you. All in Christ Jesus. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. The only way you can have the grace of the Lord Jesus is through faith in him. And you can be saved through his, with his grace through, your, through faith in him. Call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Don't say call on the name of the Lord and have a cookie and some wine. It doesn't say call on the name of the Lord and take the preacher by the hand. You can pray with your preacher and your salvation. He can help you pray, but it has to be believe in thine heart and call on the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. Hope everybody's got that.